this will be our 15th installment on the Lord's table. Now, as you must know, this table is a place of uh, intense involvement. It may look like a ritual, but it, it really is not. Or shall I say a mere ritual, but it is not. <clears throat> Here we are told in 1 Corinthians 10 that we commune, fellowship, intra-involvement. We commune with the body of Christ and we commune with the blood of Christ. That is to say we participate in what the body of Christ and the blood of Christ accomplished when it was on the tree. <coughs> For instance, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24 That's personalized at this table. I will tell you right up front that you will not have much success overcoming sin until you know that Jesus took it away. Amen. It's, it's most difficult enough knowing that. It's impossible without it. Amen. We commune with the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's a statement. In 1 John 1, 9, that's the fact of the case, but if you don't know it, and you don't participate in the joy of it, like God does, oh, God was glad when your sin was taken away. Amen. He wanted to be at peace with you. So you should be glad when you know you will be glad when you know it's taken away. Not this table, you know, the scripture tell us, tells us that God will confirm us unto the end. That's 1 Corinthians 1 8. God will confirm you, that means stabilize you, make you secure, make you able to stand. He'll confirm you to the end. That's, that's when the battle's over. Yeah. So that you may be blameless. That's why you're being confirmed. That you might be blameless in the day of Christ. Because when Jesus comes, if you're not blameless, you're out. Amen. This is the time to be blameless. Yeah. The next verse says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's how God confirms you see by, by linking you up with Christ. Amen. It's not just a formality, it's a fellowship with Christ. There's the things that pass from Christ to you. Grace and peace and strength and joy and righteousness and peace. <laughs> it all passes from Christ to you in fellowship. Well, at this table, this fellowship is intensified. If you will conduct yourself properly at this table, you will receive things beyond your imagination. You will be unable to really put it into words to anybody else. But you'll sense it. You'll know it. And then the rest of your life you'll spend coming to understand what you sense and what you kind of detect in your spirit. But you're not able to fully express it yet. But then you've got a lifetime to learn how to Amen. express it. And at this table God's present. He's, he's judging on people's hearts. <laughs> at this table. He does do this. It's a lot better if you participate in it yourself. God's going to examine you. You may or may not be aware of it. We don't advise that you be ignorant of it. 
mind may be drifting around someplace and God searched it. <laughs> God searching your heart because he said the Lord searches the hearts and the reins. It's the inward parts of your spirit. God searches it at this table. At this table, sensitive people are concentrating on Jesus and his atoning death. They're f focusing on it because they, they know by intuition that there's a lot here. They know by revelation the fundamental things that are here in the death of Christ. They're concentrating on him. Whenever you start concentrating on Christ, heaven wakes up. Amen. You start paying attention to Christ, God is alert. Yeah. To you, I mean, he's alert. And this the table of the Lord is a collective activity. It's when you come together, this is how Paul put it, when you come together in one place, that's where you do this. Yeah. So you're not like on your own. You do it at home, you do it at home, I do it at home. It's not, it's not that kind of activity. It's a joint activity because Jesus has more to dispense at this table than you are able to contain. He's got to have a lot of other people here to pour out what he's got to give. Amen. And the involvement of God in these things is to be evident, that we to be conscious not of what we're doing, so much as what God is doing. Now our text says, let a man examine himself. And so, that is in this state of examination, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And I want to examine this, uh, e this text tonight. <clears throat> now this, examine yourself, this is actually a prelude to coming before the Lord. Uh, you don't want to come before the Lord unprepared. When Jesus shows up, he's seen in all of his pristine glory, we stand before God I shouldn't have to comment at length about the destiny of people who aren't going to be prepared. It is not going to go well. Amen. If the coming of the Lord surprises you, well, we want to go into that. You, don't, you just don't want to be in that category because the scriptures speak of those who look for him. In fact, when you are converted, you were turned from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. Second Thessalonians, the first chapter. Now, I'll deal with this as we proceed, but there's a certain protocol when you come close to God. You just like don't jump into the presence of God. There's a certain protocol. It's spelled out in scripture. In Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So this is the divine protocol to come to approaching. This has got to be done. And if you don't do it, it won't be done. Amen. So that's what we're talking about here, coming before God. You, you can't remember Jesus without focusing on him. Yeah. You'll be carried aside. Amen. If you decide that your own methodology on how to draw near to Christ and ponder him, you'll find your mind strain here and strain there. You won't be able to do it. You've got to focus on Christ. And I, may I add, may I add that the only thing you know about Christ is what God told you. That's yeah, it. In the scripture, that's the record God's given of his son, 1 John 5, 10. You don't know a single solitary thing about Jesus except what's in the Bible that God said about him. That's it. That's all you know. So if you don't know the Bible, well, let's be honest about it. You're going to have a hard time focusing on Jesus. You may think you're doing it. 
But you'll just be looking at a little aspect. You'll be looking at one of his fingers <laughs> versus to his whole person. But it presumes that you, uh, you're focused on him. And Jesus meets us here. He said to his disciples, he said, I say to you, I'm telling you now, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new, new, a new way in the kingdom of God. When was that? Well, he told them that the kingdom of God is going to appear shortly. He told his disciples that. So he's speaking about when he was exalted in heaven and he joined us in these activities from heaven. I'm going to drink it new. It's going to be... You'll see more than the disciples saw the night this was instituted. Yeah. It's better enough coming before the Lord, focusing upon Him. Here, fellowship with Christ is elevated to a new, a new plateau. He's called you into the fellowship of His Son, but His fellowship of the Son is, is not just on a horizontal plane or just linear plane, just kind of goes along. There's peaks to this fellowship, and this Lord's table is one of them. Here at this table, there's the communion of the Holy Spirit, it's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the communion of the Holy Spirit, or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to think about the profundity of what takes place at this table. There's something happening between you and the Holy Spirit, and between you and Jesus, and between you and God is happening at this at this table that all focuses on his death that's what we're remembering why why not remember his ministry why not when you hear remember the feeding of the 5,000 or the calming of the sea or the casting of the demons thousand demons out of the gathering demoniac why isn't that what we remember? Why don't we remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Why is why is it why don't we remember that? I will tell you why. It's because in his death something happened that didn't happen anywhere else. Amen. This is where Satan was defeated. Amen. Amen. We through death, Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death, Hebrews 2.12. It's because he hit the cross, that's where Jesus spoiled or plundered principalities and powers that had held the world hostage for 4,000 years. That's where this happened. At the cross. This is where we especially were crucified with Christ. Jesus Christ, we were able to be joined with Christ, the Christ of the cross. This is able to happen. The death of Christ, why this, this is where the enmity was slain. Or what separated us from God was killed. It was a living power. Ephesians 2.16 says he slew the enmity in his cross. The thing that was killing you, God killed it. Mm -hmm. And he did it at the cross. Yeah. Now let there be no uh, doubt about the sanctity of this moment, about remembering Christ's atoning death. Theologically, we'd call it a vicarious death. That is a substitutionary That He didn't die for himself. Right. He died for the world. Yeah. That's what he died for. Now we get a glimpse of Christ, the glorified Christ in the Revelation. There's quite a few glimpses of him, in fact, in the Revelation. But there is one around. He's in the throne. He's in the throne, in the midst of the throne. And the four living creatures are around him. The 24 elders are around them. The angel hosts are around them. And as John Pierce, he says, I beheld a lamb as it had been slain. That is, Jesus looked like he had just died from his wounds, we're talking about. He had the appearance of a freshly slain lamb. See, heavens never got over Christ's death. Amen. Amen. 
it's still a sign of wonder and a sign of contemplation that Jesus died. So isn't it appropriate that we consider him in that capacity here? Amen. Now there's some things that will be confirmed at this table because these things occurred when Jesus died, took place. Here you'll realize if you will allow the Spirit to work with you that you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, it'll be hard to serve God if you don't know you're at peace with Him. I'm not talking about theoretically talking about this. as a, This is a theological point. We have peace with God. I mean, this is a very real peace. But when you see that you have peace with God, you don't have trouble living for God. You don't have trouble seeking after God or seeking to please God, not if you know you're at peace with God, but if you think, and oh, don't think you're incapable of not thinking it, if you think God's angry with you, or that you're at odds with God, it'll be awfully hard to serve Him, if not impossible. This can be stamped on your conscience here, you have peace with God. He'll experience the truth of being reconciled to God. I mean, God shows you his, to speak vulgarly, God shows you his friendly side. Yeah, uh -huh. You've been reconciled to him. You're not at enmity with him. You're not against him anymore. And you once were. Here your newness of life can be revealed here at this table. And here your hope. So often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Uh -huh. See, that got this forward stance. Here at this table, your strangership can be confirmed. I beseech you, Peter said, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Well, some people perhaps this day have caved in to some kind of fleshly lust. They were unable, they thought, to abstain from it. But I will tell you that if you take advantage of this table, You'll have power to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Because when Jesus has filled your vision, sin becomes obnoxious. Sin hurts you. It hurts you. He that has suffered in the flesh, Peter said, has ceased from sin. That means when sin hurts you, you stop doing it. Amen. See, Amen. why do some people can't stop? Because they like it. And people like what hurts. A lot of people like that, you know. These are things that happen at this table. Now I want to touch on like what's involved. When we say examine, let a man examine himself. Like, what do we mean when we say that? Now the examination is to avoid <laughs> partaking of the table unworthily. That's what we're uh, endeavoring to do. Here's what the scripture says in the preceding verse. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now that, oh, oh, that's a frightening verse. What does it mean, be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Instead of Christ's death counting for your freedom, you are held personally responsible for killing him. Amen. That's what it means. There's only two ways, there's only two things that can happen here. Either credit for Christ's death is deposited at your account, or justification because of Christ is credited to your account. There's only two things that can happen here. Self-examination is to avoid God saying unworthy. Say we're all unworthy, aren't we? Not in this sense. God can make you worthy. All right, now what do we mean by not being worthy or examining yourself? This is not an examination for sin. We'll be quite clear about this. This is not what we're looking for. If you are, you will find you will find some. 
This is not in the category when David says, Search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Psalm 139, verse 24. This isn't that kind of search. Wayward inclinations are to be seen versus specific transgressions. There's a difference. There's a difference in feeling a pull towards sin and committing a sin. There's a difference. So if we do take it, although even that isn't to be the fundamental quest. Now again, we come to this approach. I want to go back to this approach that's mentioned in Hebrews 10.22. I want to show you, to example, what, what is required for you to approach? That's just draw near. What is required for you to draw near? Here it's spelled out. Draw near with a true heart. I mean, you had to be honest and true about this. You're not trying to come into God's good pleasure. Your heart's been purified by faith. And you're not reluctant to come near to him. you got to come with that kind of heart. You say, well, I don't have that kind of heart. Then you got like a few seconds to get it. Yeah. You've got to have that kind of heart or God won't let you come near. Mm -hmm. Nobody with a defiled conscience will draw near to God. They'll draw back from God, just like Adam did. The true heart and full assurance of faith. See, once you have faith, you know because God said so. You're accepted by God. You've been made accepted in the beloved. That's Ephesians 1 and 6. You know this is true. You've got to come in a state of acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what if there's something there that I need to get rid of? Confess your sin and then come. If there's something stopping you, before we do this, you got to get that thing settled with God. It's going to take a long time. Just you confess it, you admit it. You, we used to say, "Shell the corn down." You admit it. God will cleanse you if we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now you're fit to come with a. Full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, you can't come in a state of self-condemnation. See, self-condemnation in the first place is a delusion. If Jesus has freed you from condemnation, then it's wrong to feel condemned. If you do, well, then there's some something you got to get shed of that Jesus died for. Come in the Heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. And the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse or purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's what Hebrews 9.14 says. So God, Christ's blood can do this. This table isn't the place where you get remission. You get it before you come to this table. Because that you got to have that to approach unto God. And your body's washed with pure water. We understand this to be Referring to being baptized into Christ. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, well, you got you got to obey it. The form of the doctrine which was delivered to you, as Romans 6, 17 says. So this is the approach. Now, now let's look at the examination. What am I going to look for? Strange. I... I used to think this way myself, but I can't really figure out why I did. But almost always people think of this as looking for some sin in your life. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about looking for to find something God's done in your life. Yeah. Some evidence in your life. That Christ is God is for you and not against you. Some evidence that you've been accepted. Now there's a, there is a lot of evidence. You want to see if you can find it? Here's one. If you've received the love of the truth, Second Thessalonians 2:10 says that they receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Do you love the truth? Now, nobody can answer this for you. If you love the truth, hey, that's a good thing to find. Because yeah. God's already said he's going to save people yes. that love the truth. <laughs> so
So you examine yourself. Do I love the truth? Some people have to say, well, no, I don't. I get upset when someone reads a lot of the Bible. I get kind of upset. I don't, th I don't think there's anyone like that here. But that's what you want to examine yourself to see if you got that love of the truth. Well, here's another thing you can examine yourself for. Am I pressing toward the mark? As Philippians 3.10, forgetting the things behind, behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Press means you push through the obstacle. Now, there's an example of it. That woman had an issue of blood. You remember that woman with an issue of blood? There was a big crowd between her and Jesus. She said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. But the, the, the complication was it's a big crowd between her and Jesus. And if you've ever been in the Middle East, hey, it redefines what crowd means. Let me tell you that. The scripture says she went through the press. I could just, I could just see her pushing them aside, pressing in toward it. She's on the ground, keep it. She's on the ground, pushing through that multitude. That's the way it is going to glory. You got to push through a bunch of stuff. You can do it. And if you're pressing toward the mark, you're moving past the things that Satan raised up, see, to stop you. You're going through it. The Lord Jesus on the right hand will say, let them through. Amen. Let them through. Amen. They got to obey him. The demons had to obey him when he was on earth. They sure do now. Pressing toward the mark. Are you pressing toward the mark? Doing your dead level best to reach the goal, to reach heaven? You're a suitable candidate. When you find that, you just say, thank, thank you, Lord. For giving me this pressing spirit. Because I remember when I didn't have it. Now I got it. I know where I got it. And I'm coming Lord. I'm coming. And the Lord will make a way for you. to. Yeah, it's good to find that. You might be prone to look for what you did yesterday that was bad. Well you probably did something yesterday that was bad. I, I don't question that. But the way to really see those things right is to do this pressing because the closer you get to Christ the clearer stuff back here becomes because he's the light see and as you enter more into the light then it sheds and things you thought you have done maybe you didn't really do them at all maybe you were just tempted to do them huh? but you're so sensitive to sin maybe you thought the temptation was a sin but it's not a sin to be tempted because Jesus was tempted and he didn't sin. See, but you can see that a little clear as you, as you press in. Or how about this hallmark? The love of the brethren. Do you love God's people or do you think they're a bunch of weirdos? Which one is it? John said, by this you know you've passed from death unto life. Because you love the brethren. So here you are, you're coming out or on there and you're thinking, all oh, the people of God, how I love them. How I thank God, how they prayed for me. How they helped me when I was despised by other people. The people of God didn't do it and you're loving the brethren. Oh Lord, I want to do some good to them. I want to help them out. That's examining yourself and finding some good things. And it'll, it'll sweeten your experience at the table of the Lord. Or how about finding this that you have forsaken all to follow Christ. Jesus said if a man does not forsake everything that he has and take up his cross daily, he can't be my disciple. Amen. He can't be. But you have. What does that mean forsake all? Become a pauper and live like a hermit up on the top of a mountain? Is that what that means? That means whatever kept you from coming to Christ, you said, that's, that's it. Whoever's competing 
For my love for Christ, I'm dropping that relationship. That's what it means now. Someone said, well, I don't know whether you should do that or not. Well, you better do it because Jesus dropped his relationship to save you. Yeah, right. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. He humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, mm -hmm. became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and he expects that from you. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that when you do this, what you, what you are given for doing it outweighs, <laughs> outweighs all the stuff you left behind. So examine yourself. See, have I forsaken all? Good thing to find. How about this? Examine yourself and check up on your affections. Are they set on things above? As Colossians 3.1 says, where Christ sits to the right hand of God. Are you seeking the things that are above and not the things that are on the earth? Now, if you've been in Christ for a while, you... God will make you able to evaluate this and come up with a proper conclusion. But if you conclude, yes, I, I feel my best when I can see the things of God clearly. I feel my best. I'm at my best. You say, well, that's good. That's good. You're seeking the right thing. Are you discontent with life in this world? You long for a better country like those things? Do you really experience in this? You found something <laughs> that qualifies you to sit at this table and blesses your soul. Or how about this? Romans 5, 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. So the Holy Spirit, he takes God's love for you and he permeates your thinking with it. Amen. So that you begin to see it from all different kind of angles. How God has confirmed his love to you. He confirmed it by sending his son. So you don't have to question. By this we know that he loved us. Because he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we got the evidence of that. And when you find your heart being filled with this other people are saying, I love yourself. You can't love others till you love yourself. <laughs> you dummies. These people are dummies. I mean, someone's got to say it. Psychiatrist tells people this, but this isn't the truth. Jesus said, whoever loves his life is going to lose it. Whoever hates his life for my sake will save it. Now, you can't get any plainer than that. You say, well, what? I, I don't understand. Well, because God, if God loves you, what do you need to love yourself for? Amen. God can do something about right. your condition. If his love is towards you, this, like, this is like a carte blank, carte blanc card to the riches of glory. So you examine yourself. See if the love of God is abroad in your heart. Surely you're not one that has more of a love for rules and routines and procedures and all that sort of thing. Brother Ricky preached about this morning. And you see, though, oh, that's, not, that's not the way to come. Well, you found something, see? You search, search your heart, you found something. And here's another thing. You're discontent with your body. Not just because it's old and feeble. My mind's getting that way. That's not what we're talking about here. There's a lot of people old and feeble and firm sitting in wheelchairs and quadriplegics that are very productive. All kind of them. Hmm? We're saying that what you desire to do, you find your body incapable of doing this. Sometimes I don't want to really go to sleep. I'm right in the middle of right in the middle of some great thought that I've got, I've got to go to sleep. I'm losing my capacity to think. And I'm this old wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I've got to go to sleep and I'm sitting in the courts of the Lord. Yeah. Well, do you feel discontent in this body? Are you, have, your, has your, have your aspirations exceeded your human capacity and ability? You found a good thing there. Amen. 
You examine yourself and find that. That's the kind of person God's looking for. <laughs> He's looking to show himself strong in behalf of them that fear him. That's that First Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord are running to and running. Running. It says the devils are walking. Right? Yeah. It says the devil walks right. uh -huh. to and fro, seeking him and may devour. But God's eyes are running. Looking here and looking there. Where, where's somebody I can bless? Where's somebody whose heart set this way and wants me? I'll pour a blessing out on them. Amen. <laughs> All right. You that kind of person? You can come. Not be condemned. No matter what your past is. Ah, no matter what your past is. You can come to this table. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5, After telling us that we know if the earthly house of this tabernacle be destroyed, we have a building of God, a house eternal in the heavens. That we're looking to be unclothed from this body, to be divested of this body, put on our new body. It's not that we want to be naked, have a naked soul. It's not that we just want to be without a body, because we were made to have bodies. But this house from heaven, that's your new body, resurrection body. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says, He that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing as God. In other words, in redemption, God has made you to fit into an immortal body. Amen. Oh, what a thought. Amen. We don't fit in these bodies, see. We're going to fit into that immortal body. Is that what you want? Then you can come to this, <laughs> to this table. Now, there, I could say a lot more. I, I will not say any more than that. But this is the type of examination you want to conduct. I'm not saying that it's impossible that you not find something you need. To, I'm not saying that that you you may find something you got to deal with right away. But that's that's the secondary. The first thing is to find some evidence in yourself. Find some evidence that God's done in you what he said he was going to do to those that are in Christ Jesus. And when you found it, the well of thanksgiving will be uncapped. And you'll start to thank and praise God that he made you worthy. And then you can eat at this table without any fear of judgment. So I call you to that kind of remembrance. And I tell you that that's the kind that's precious in God's sight. God does want, he does want his people to be aware of their any shortcomings in their life. This, this is true, and we don't deprecate that. But at this table, if you're not remembering what God has done through Christ for you, that's what makes you unworthy. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I call you to that kind of remembrance. Brother Gene has our exhortation.